We're so grateful you're here to worship with us on this June summer day. We're starting a brand new sermon series entitled Alive, Six Steps Towards a Better You. Also today, this afternoon at 5 p.m. right here in the sanctuary, the Emmy award-winning series, Life on the Line. We're gonna see two episodes. It'll be hosted by Dr. Richard Hart, and there'll be an opportunity for question and answers afterwards. These are some really compelling stories. You're not gonna to wanna to miss it. And then also a reminder, our quilters are getting together again tomorrow at 9 a.m. and Monday. They're in room 105. They'd love to have you there, and there's free food, or there's a potluck each and every day. And then also we mentioned last week, there are just a couple more seats available on the upcoming Reformation Tour in September. So we ask if you are interested, go to the website, click on the bulletin, and you'll see some information in the bulletin where you can email and make a request. We'd love to have you there, but you better do it fast if you're interested because the seats are going fast. Our You Care Ministry is at it again. They're gonna have another brunch and learn. It'll be July 14th, that's a Sunday from 11 to one. The free seminar is entitled Key Legal Issues That Impact Aging. It's presented by Esther Wong, attorney at law. That's Sunday, July 14, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. in room 1402. Registration is required and they need that by July 10. Well, that's our announcements for today. For the latest information, go to our website, luc.org. We hope you have a wonderful and meaningful Sabbath day.
Well, it's still morning, so I get to tell you good morning and happy Sabbath. Thank you. Uh, this week also marked on Thursday the first day of summer, uh, which was the longest day of the year. I really enjoy that. Uh, so I would like you now to also greet the person next to you, let them know happy Sabbath, but also I would like you to take a little poll of a few people around you. Do you prefer winter or summer? Go. Okay, well, I don't know what you got in your poll, but I definitely got more summer. So score for my side, I do prefer summer. Now, um, here, however, at Loma Linda University Church and in Anthem, we keep it really cool for you, okay, <laughs> during, the, during the summertime. So if you're feeling extra hot, you know, maybe just come to two services or three or four. Um, also, we do have a special seating. Trust me, I've been in the sanctuary a lot. So if you sit in this section over here, under these eaves, or over here, you'll get extra cool air. You might, you, might, you might not find me there very often. Anyways, we're so glad you've come to worship today. This is the beginning first series with Pastor Miguel. Um, this morning was amazing. We're so happy that you've come. Please stand. Welcome to worship.
Amen. Truly beautiful. If you are able, would you join me in kneeling for prayer? Uh, To the one who is and was and will be. And to the one in whom we live and move and have our being. God, we come before you. It is a beautiful thing to be found still and silent in your sanctuary. Here on bended knee, Lord, we live in a world where people need to learn to submit to good authority. God, it is a joy to be here with brothers and sisters in faith before you. God, as we come before you this morning, our souls long to be heard by you and to be in communion with you. And so now, Lord, in this silence, I turn this moment over for silent prayer from our congregation to you. Lord, our hearts now speak to you. God, we thank you for this moment. It is a truly beautiful thing to be here with our family of faith, knowing that our hearts are in communion with you, knowing that beside us, everybody's heart is open in prayer, prayers for hope and forgiveness, love, faith and blessings. God, it is good to be still in your sanctuary from a world that is so busy and so hurried. Thank you so much for your incredible presence that we feel now. Bless us as we continue to worship. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I had the privilege of serving as a chaperone to the Loma Linda Academy Wind Symphony Tour to Spain. Um, it was an incredible journey. As some of you know, our very own Craig Moore leads that group, and he and the students that went, they performed spectacularly, not just in the ways that they performed music, um, which they did. They, they performed to sold out crowds and got standing ovations. But not only that, they also, it, they also performed admirably in the ways that they conducted themselves in building relationships across borders. And the reason why I share that this morning is because it always strikes me that no matter where I go, I always find people who are connected to the ministry of the Loma Linda University Church. And that was no different than on this trip. In, in Segunto, I met a f- a several people. And then when I went later with uh, my family to Paris, I also met a couple there that is connected to the ministry here. Either they were, they were either attending here for a season of their lives or they're part of our online community. And so I wanted to start by saying thank you. Thank you for contributing to a ministry uh, that reaches a global community. Last week, Pastor Randy shared a very powerful message about how hope leads to generosity and gave you a glimpse of of what it takes to operate this church. 
And the response to that was overwhelming. Just in one week, um, the, the, the offerings that came in to support have been tremendous and has helped us close the gap in our deficit for this year. But we still have a little bit left. So the Finance Committee has put together a tool to help us to keep track of that. And so our Finance Committee Chair and Head Elder Richard Bloom Johnson is going to share a little bit about that. Thank you, Joey. Good morning. So last week, Pastor Randy spoke about the importance of giving and what happens with our tithes and offerings once we receive them. As you recall, he broke it down into percentages as to where they go. And the percentage of church budget was about 2% uh, of the whole, which was, as we stated on that day, $2 million. Now you'll notice when we get to our graph, it says $3 million. And that is because also what is included in that number is our subsidy responsibility to Loma Linda Academy as well as our tuition aid. So that way, if you see a variance in your memory with the number you see this morning, that is where that comes from. With that being said, this number for church budget is what makes it possible for us to take care of the plant here as our church, uh, to provide all the programs that we provide, and to be able to do our um, broadcast for people that worship with us from afar. With that being said, the Finance Committee took a good long look at the deficit issue we've had for the last two years. And we determined that in addition to a few adjustments that we had, if we as a, a church leadership want to continue to be transparent with you about our financial position, we need to keep you aware of how we're doing. So <clears throat> what we determined was that we needed a tool to do that. So we developed, if you look at the screen, or in your bulletin actually, you will see a small graph called church budget. This is not to be confused with the graph on the other page, which is a pie graph for our building project fund. But regarding the church budget, if you look at this graph, we, it, it tells you that it's for our church budget, and then it's a simple line graph. The green line shows the amount of money that we have received as we work towards our goal for the budget. The red line demonstrates any deficit that remains that we would potentially need to continue to work with. So as we look at the graph and as we approach this next week, the end of June, which is the end of our fiscal year that the church operates on, we can see that there is about $338,000 that we are still needing to cover for this year. Now this graph will continue to appear into the bulletin on a regular basis moving forward to help us be more uh, in line with preventing any forms of large deficits. So as we move towards the end of this week, as we approach the end of our fiscal year, we once again appreciate the faithfulness and the generosity of this church which is so humbling to all of us in leadership. We from the Finance Committee and from administration, thank you very much and we ask you to join us as we continue to move forward in trying to serve God's purpose through this church. Thank you.
Good morning, boys and girls. This is your special time to come on up to the front, but don't forget to collect all the waving bills. Those of you who are sitting in the pews, if you could push them to the side so the kids see it. And we also need you boys and girls up there on the balcony. I see some of you already busy at work. So wonderful, bring your offerings then right down here on either side in the bucket. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong, they are weak, but He is strong. Sing with me. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. me the Bible tells me so Jesus loves me he who died heaven's gate to open wide he will wash away my sin let his little child come in yeah Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Well, good morning, boys and girls. I'm so happy to see you this morning. You can put it right there in the bucket. I didn't know if many of you would be gone on vacation or not. So I wasn't sure how many boys and girls were gonna be here. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, well today I wanted to talk to you about something. It's the word identity. Now it may sound like a complex word, but it's actually quite simple. It's who you are. Now, you have unique characteristics and unique things about you, and if you look to the person next to you, no one is like you. Look to the boy and girl next to you. You're not like the person next to you because God made you a very special, and he made you unique. Well, let's talk about some of the things that make our identity. So if you look on the screen, you will see some sports. Now, how many of you like sports? Me. Oh, lots of you. Maybe you like badminton, maybe you like volleyball, or maybe you're really good at bowling. I don't know, that could be something that's unique. Okay, let's see, what's the next slide here? Oh, how many of you wear glasses? I see glasses, I wear glasses. You know what, sometimes we don't wear glasses and then I just started wearing glasses. This is just a very small part of our identity. It doesn't define who we are, it's just a small little piece. Let's see, how many of you like art? Victoria, you need to raise your hand. Maybe you like art right now, and maybe as you get older you're like, I don't like coloring quite as much, or I wanna try painting. We change some of the things we like, and again, it's only a small little part of who we are. What about this? How many of you have a, a pet, a dog or a cat? You have two? That's awesome, you have two? Oh, that's great. Oh, you have one? Okay, well, you know what? Sometimes our pets become part of our family's identity and we go ahead and we spend time doing things with our pets and our families. That can be part of our identity, but again, it's just a little tiny piece. 
How many of you love math at school? Oh, I see some math lovers, fantastic, that is great. Not all of you raised your hand because not every one of us is good at math. Some of us are better at math than others. What about this? <gasps> Who plays the guitar? Does anybody, oh, good for you, wow. <laughs> you started early. You play the guitar too? Awesome. Okay, maybe you like to play um, the piano or maybe you're like, my mom and dad make me take the piano and I don't like to practice. This may change as you get older and maybe you want to play the piano, maybe you don't. Those are some things that change. Well, boys and girls, you know what? It's okay to be completely different and to be who you are. God made us all very, very different from each other, and he doesn't care if we're good at one thing or another. There are three simple things that I want you to remember that God cares about. First of all, he loves you. That is without a shadow of a doubt. The second thing, he is always with you. And third thing, he has a plan for every single one of you. Isn't that awesome? Because of those three things, we can trust him and we can follow him. God has a bigger picture of who we are. And it doesn't matter what we like or what we do, he loves us this much. So boys and girls, as you think about your identity, remember that the best thing we can do is have God pour into us to help us create, create our identity in him. Thank you so much for listening. You can go back to your seats now.
Good morning, church. My name is Hendrik Hutagal. I serve as chaplain at the East Campus Hospital of Loma Linda University Medical Center. I have Grant here with me. He's my son. He just turned 14 two days ago and just finished middle school um, about two weeks ago now. About a year ago, we started studying the Bible together. I started giving him a memory verse and then more memory verse, but I asked him to get his own memory verse, and this is what he recited. Proverbs 10, verse 1. Remember that, Grant? Can you say that? And, and, and so I asked him, which one are you, son? And he said, I'm working on the first one. And he's uh, really made it. Um, about six weeks ago, his teacher called me and then gave the phone to him. And, and, and he said, Dad, I got two awards this coming week. And being an Asian dad, you know, um, we're not too excited about <laughs> our kids' accomplishments. Sometimes we're more excited when they got in trouble. So, <laughs> but um, I was really overjoyed at that time. And I said, that's wonderful, son. And, and we attended the ceremony. And three weeks ago, four weeks ago, he asked me, Dad, would you baptize me? And he wanted to be baptized last weekend for Father's Day gift. But I said, that might be too short of a notice for the church. So what makes me proud is certainly his decision right now to be baptized. And when I ask him, why do you want to be baptized now? He said, I now realize Jesus Christ is my salvation and my freedom. We are wearing the Pathfinder um, uniform here because he also attributes his personal and spiritual growth um, significantly for the past year after he joined the Pathfinder. He was with the Adventurers Club prior to that, and... Uh, at the Pathfinder's classes, uh, he's been also studying the Bible with the teacher. So I, I want to have a round of applause for the Pathfinder's first right now uh, for guiding this young man to him. Um, and if you would like to support them in their ministry or bring your kids to join them, I highly encourage that. Grant uh, has his grandfather from his... Um, paternal grandparents right here, and also family members. Uh, if you could stand real quick to uh, show that um, you are supporting Grant's decision today. There they are, right there. Uh, some of them are watching because uh, they're overseas doing some short missionary uh, trip right now. Um, and, and of course, um, there are some friends and, and, and the Pathfinders. If, if you could also stand real quick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, Grant, are you ready now? Okay. Well, Grant, because you realize that Jesus loves you. And that he is your salvation and liberty. I am very pleased and I am overjoyed. And I baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, if you have not received Jesus through baptism, and if you would like to join us 
receiving the peace and salvation through Jesus Christ through baptism. And if you would like to know Him more, we are available. The church pastoral team, the deacons, the elders are here to help you. We will walk with you. We will study with you. We will journey with you in making the decision to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Lord bless us all. Thank you. Happy Sabbath. Our scripture today is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. What up, dude? Here. 
Oh, is this sound? So you can go ahead. Yeah, well, we're very excited to, to head out. We've got some of the people so, here already. It's going to be great. From Linda okay. University, I'm I'm Church, okay, great. Kenya trip. All right, get out of my face. Um,
Don't you know I am not the subject of your thing? You always have the camera in my face. Go away. Go away. Go away. Goodbye. <laughs>well that was uh, my good friend Simone Dennis the associate uh, director for our outreach ministries here at Loma Linda University Church telling you to go away um, I usually listen to Simone except this time we don't want you to go away we want to we want you to come with and we, the reason we want you to come with is service is something that has the capacity to change your life. I mean, sure, sure, you'll see some fantastic wildlife, and you'll help people in a very real, palpable, and practical way. But perhaps the most important thing is that you will have the chance to learn something about yourself that you might not know otherwise. So October 2025, we're heading back out. Don't go away. Plan to join us. It just might be transformational. As I was watching that video, I realized that whether it's here or in Kenya, opening your senses to the world around you is the prelude to opening your heart to the world that God has curated inside you. And so as we talk about this sermon series, six weeks in which we are journeying together, in order to provide us with some tools for better living, our hope is that you, both your heart and your senses are open. Now, the way we're going to work for the next couple of weeks is a little different. Here at Loma Linda, we're really good at intellectualizing stuff, but I'm sure you'll agree that a tool is an artifact that gets perfected through practice. And so we're going to provide some practical ways in which you can actually achieve the life that God has intended for you. But in order to do that, first we need to recognize that we all have some kind of hang-up. So Simone and I share the same pet peeve. We don't like cameras in our faces. And perhaps your pet, you have your own pet peeves. Uh, for me, it's a bad grammar. Not a fan of bad grammar. So what, else, what other pet peeves do I have? Um, oh, I know. Any and all conversations about the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, if they're so great, you can just move back to Texas. It was nice serving as your pastor. <laughs> Same goes for the L.A. Dodgers. I, I know some of you love them, but come on. Really? Uh, but my biggest pet peeve, quite honestly, is uh, the middle seat on long flights. Yeah. So I'm on my way from LAX to Amsterdam on the first leg of this trip, and I, I, I have a middle seat. And so I go get on the plane, and I sit down, and next to me is this lovely, lovely L elderly uh, lady who, who just turns and is just brimming with energy. It's just so much energy coming at me. <laughs> and um, she thinks it's really important that I understand the difference between butter and margarine <laughs> in order to get the fluffiest chocolate chip cookies. I tell her, well, I, I don't really like chocolate chip cookies. I'm more of a fan of oatmeal raisin. And yeah, that didn't go well. That didn't go well. We, we debated for a while, and I really wasn't that into the conversation because all along I was praying a silent prayer. Uh, please, Lord, don't let anyone else sit next to me. And that prayer wasn't answered. Uh, so we're about to take off, and this, this Dutch gentleman sits down, and no, no one is as congenial, interesting, and talkative as, as the Dutch said no one ever. So here I am. On one side, I've got chocolate chip cookie. On the other hand, I have the Iceman. And I'm sitting in the middle, 
And the reason why I hate the middle seat isn't uh, what you would think of at first. So I know that most of you hate the, mid the middle seat because of comfort. For me, that's not the case. Uh, it's something that only those of you who are introverts in the room are going to understand. Because to sit in the middle seat means to be forced, particularly on a long flight, to engage into a conversation with someone on bathroom etiquette. <laughs> so here I am praying that uh, we won't have to have this, this awkward conversation. And, and somewhere over the, the Atlantic, uh, my, my seatmate, fell asleep, and somewhere over Iceland, the Coke that I, had, that I had had at LAX had to go to, well, all the place that all other Diet Coke goes. And so I'm, I'm having to, to debate, am I gonna hold it, am I gonna wake him up? Am I gonna hold him, wake him up, hold it, wake him up. And then I realized that there's a third option. And this is a third option that only you who are introverts in the room are going to understand. It's neither holding it nor waking him up. After all, I am fairly agile. <laughs> I'm also slender. And so I decide I am going to climb over him. And I'm praying this, this other prayer Lord, please don't let me wake up this man. And somewhere over Iceland, that prayer was not answered because we hit a patch of turbulence. And, well, I ended up in his lap. <laughs> now, there is no other way to describe this and I don't think there's a more awkward position to be in than waking somebody up and engaging in this very personal, very intimate, very close space with this face. So he wakes up and he says, hello, and I say, good morning. He says, what do you do? I say, I'm a pastor. And I don't know why I didn't get up. At some point you get up, right? But no, we're having this conversation. He says, what denomination? Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> We're part of the Anabaptist tradition. You know, we believe in the Sabbath, 1844, and we, I gave them the whole Bible study there. And I realized that the reason why this is so incredibly uncomfortable is because we are very particular about our personal space, aren't we? And it's not just our personal space as in the space I occupy, it's our intellectual spaces. Let's face it, most of us have created a very comfortable little echo chamber or a niche or a silo that we've propped up with all the pillows and the trimmings, people that agree with our same opinions, people that look the same way, that are in the same tax bracket, that have the same ideology, that go to church on the same day. We have created these echo chambers. And now I'm staring face to face with the idea of personal space crumbling. And I realized at that moment, as I was still sitting on his lap somewhere over Ireland, <laughs> that that is not the way God intended for us to live. So I want you to open your Bibles with me. And we're going to go to the Book of Ephesians, we're going to look at the second chapter, and this afternoon we're only going to look at one verse. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And the Word of God reads, For we are God's handiwork, created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, Ephesians is Paul's Magna Carta. It is the maximum expression he has about his Christology. It is in Ephesians that you will have this beautiful hymn to the Creator. But here in chapter 2, verse 10, Paul is saying, we are God's handiwork. 
And the original language renders the sentence something like this. His workmanship are we. I want you to just pause and let that kind of jumbled up sentence linger over your mind for a second. In that sentence, his handiwork are we, the primary noun is his. And it's almost as if the author of Ephesians is reminding us that everything, this whole world that we have curated for ourselves as believers begins and ends with him. He is reminding us that inside each and every one of us, we bear the image of the divine, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done. That word that in your Bibles appears as workmanship is actually the Greek poema. And if you know a little bit of Spanish or Portuguese or perhaps even English, that word should sound familiar as you begin to register it. Poema. It's the word from which our English poem arises. So in a very real sense, what Paul, what Paul is attempting to share is that you and I are God's poem. You are a work of art and an artisan at work. And I truly believe, church, that most of the issues that we have, most of the battles that we are called to fight, would disappear if for the briefest of moments we could step out of our bodies and see ourselves in the same way that God sees you. When is the last time you stared in a mirror, looked at yourself, saw beyond the brokenness and the issues and the hang-ups, and said, I am God's masterpiece? And if you've never done that, fret not, we're going to do that today. So I want to channel my best Pastor Philip impersonation and tell you today to look at the person next to you and say, you are a poem. That is not rhetorical, that's for you to do now. You are a poem, I want to hear it. How did that feel? You see, the reality of life is as we continue to live in our echo chambers, we create competition, right? We thrive on it. Those that are with me or for me and those that are against me, and we better have the right answers and have the capacity to win. But once you realize that, The people next to us, the people that we have called to do life with, are works of arts and art and artisans at work, that they are poetry in motion. Guess what happens? Your value system changes and you start to create a rule of life where you begin to prioritize community over competition. Let me repeat that lest it escape you. If you want to create a rule of life that provides you the capacity to live as God intended you to live, then you must prioritize community over competition. And that's hard to do, isn't it? I mean, we're not trained typically to live this way. Let's face it, the church has done a really good job of casting ourselves in this image that we are not thrilled with. Which is why I find the words of that hero of homileticians, the great Fred Craddock, so poignant. Listen to what he writes about who you and I are are called to be. He says, I'm sick of the phrase, we're only human. Now, a shortstop can catch 300 balls, but the moment he makes a mistake and drops, drops one, the crowd will begin to chant, well, he's only human. And she will make this eight-inch cake delicious and succulent. And then there's a potluck. 
She's seeking to outdo herself, and so she puts the cake in, and when it comes out of the oven, it looks like the sole of a shoe, and she will smirk and say, well, I'm only human. The singer will go up those silver chair stairs and hit each note, making it as clear as mornings do, and the congregation will say, wasn't that wonderful? But the moment her voice cracks, I'm only human. Why, why, asks Craddock, do we associate being human with making a mistake? Could it be possible that the next time somebody looks at you and says, that was beautiful, you say, of course it was. I am only human. Or when somebody says, that is the best thing I've ever eaten in my life, you say, of course it was. I am only human. Or perhaps you find a prayer or a song particularly moving on a Sabbath, and you go up and you say, I was truly touched. That was beautiful. And the person will look back at you and say, well, thank you. But after all, I am only human. It's a different way of life, isn't it? It is not only a way of life that prioritizes community over competition. It is a way of life that realizes that if indeed we are all connected, if indeed we are all works of art and artisans at work, then perhaps competition isn't what should drive us. Perhaps and just perhaps, we need to be invested in promoting consensus, not conflict. You need to promote consensus, not conflict. But that's difficult. I'll admit it. I mean, think about the world we live in. It's a society that can be aptly described as a meritocracy. And for a meritocracy to work, there needs to be winners and losers. There needs to be those who are in and those who are out. There needs to be saints and there needs to be sinners. There needs to be the elect and the ones who will be, well, not elect. Which is why Karl Barth invites us to think a little different about our relationship with God by focusing not on the status of it, but rather on the idea that salvation is history. Salvation is history. And if the story of your redemption through this God of grace is one that is driven by his grace, let's remember Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, you were saved by grace so that nobody should boast. If salvation is driven by his grace, then, well then perhaps, perhaps, This whole mess that we call life is about realizing that each one of us is nuanced. That we all have fears, hopes, dreams. Days in which we act like saints. And also sometimes that we're complete sinners. So we prioritize community over competition, and we promote consensus over conflict. You know, that that idea of promoting consensus over conflict because it is the kind thing to do, the best example I have for that, friends, is Janine Royer, and she's going to hate me for saying this. Um, So if you've ever visited Pastor Randy's office, you've encountered Janine. You open the door, and Janine will always greet you warmly, And Janine has the patience of a saint. Believe me, I've tested it. Um, And she has a little sentence behind her desk. The sentence reads, be kind. Everyone you encounter is fighting a battle you don't know about. To try 
an attempt to orient our lives by, pra- by promoting consensus over conflict is to be kind. And kindness will lead you to adjust your value system just a bit. It'll change the things you consider important. It'll actually push you to practice simplicity over self-gain. Now, we have a bunch of examples of people practicing self-gain. 2015, VW. Engineers insert faulty software into their diesel engines in order to pass emissions testing. Those engineers knew fully well that the emissions of the TDI engines were 40 times higher than what the Environmental Protection Agency had deemed acceptable. This company, in a desperate drive for profit, put at risk its consumers, lied to its stockholders, and poisoned the environment, the world that you and I have to live in. Well, and I guess they have to live in it too. Self-gain. But just as you're kind of throwing your hands up in the air and saying, you know what, yes, it's impossible. It's impossible to practice simplicity. Ephesians reminds us, you are not only created as poems, but you were created for something. Ephesians says, you were created to do good works. The author of the letter is saying, you are hardwired to do good works. And you know what's incredible about Scripture? It's that science actually proves it. There's a neuroscientist, his name is Paul Zak. And Zak looked at this question, are human beings inherently moral? Are they hardwired to practice simplicity, to do good works? And Zach discovered what he calls the morality molecule. Now, you know what this is. It's a hormone. We call it oxytocin. And oxytocin is the hormone that is present uh, during childbirth that allows a woman to, to get through that ordeal. It is also a hormone that will flood your body when you're engaged in, engaged in any activity that gives you joy. We knew that. But what Zach discovered that was so earth-shattering was that people with elevated oxytocin demonstrated higher levels of empathy and trustworthiness. So the higher your, your oxytocin was, the more trustworthy you became. As a matter of fact, people that had high degrees of oxytocin in their system gave 50% more to their preferred charities. Oxytocin and simplicity, simplicity leads to a happier life. And I'm going to prove it to you because, friends, we know how to elevate our our degrees of oxytocin. I'm going to do so by doing something that's really uncomfortable. Really uncomfortable for me. Uh, You can take it as the prescription from Pastor Love. Can I give you a hug? That's it. That's the secret to elevated oxytocin. Zach discovered that eight hugs a day will elevate your levels of oxytocin. Simplicity over self-indulgence. And the author of Ephesians 2,000 years ago says, you are hardwired for acts of service, for good works. So, um, we've learned some things this afternoon, haven't we? We've learned that we are called to prioritize community. We've learned that it's important to promote consensus. I hope that after church is over, you're going to be hugging each other a lot. Because we've also learned that we need to practice simplicity over self-indulgence. But really, all of those things are just building blocks. Because at the heart of the matter, 
is the fourth thing that you need to do in order to give, to gain the life that God has called you to live. And this is a difficult one. You need to prefer silence over stimulus. Because in order to live the life that God called you, that God called you to live, you need to first know who you are who you are in relationship to that God, and who you are in relationship to each other. And you can't do that unless there is a period of silence and reflection, unless you carve that out. Now, I know that that makes you nervous. I know you're thinking, oh, typical Loma Linda, here they come with their new agey stuff. Or... But the funny thing is, I didn't get this principle from a guru or from a, or from a, or from a Buddhist. I want to share with you who I got it from. It was a quote by Ellen White. I want you to read it with me. I want you to reflect upon the type of life that Sister White is having us or calling us to live. So let's read this quote together. Guard jealously our hours for prayer, Bible study, and self-examination. Overburdened, the minister is so often hurried that he scarcely finds time to examine himself. Every follower of Christ should practice daily examination. One hour of meditation is more valuable than days spent studying the most able authors. The greatest and most valuable study is the study of oneself. So I'm wondering if you have carved out in your rule of life, in the rhythms that you have created and that have become entrenched in that which is you, I wonder if you've carved out some time for self-examination. And if your answer to that question is no, fret not, we're going to teach you how to do it here. And we're going to do it in the same way that Christians have been doing it for 2,000 years. A practice as old as the church itself. We're going to do it by praying together. But before we pray, I need you to be present. I know the mortgage might need to get paid and your stomach is grumbling and you're wondering, what am I going to do? It's so hot today. But just for the briefest of moments, can we be present here now? Let's pray. And as we pray, we're, we're just going to feel the weight of our body against the floor. We're here in this moment with you, God. Here we are, your, crea your creation. Poetry in motion. Works of art. Artisans at work. People who have come, not because we've earned anything. After all, heaven is not a mutual admiration society. People who have been hardwired for good works because it's the fruit of our salvation, not the root of our salvation. Here we are before you examining ourselves. In this moment, fully present. And as we present ourselves before you, we recognize that there are times and moments during this week where you have felt particularly close. Maybe it's that job that we've been praying for, the relationship restored that we've so desired, the joy of family and friends, a lazy summer day, we want to glorify you and thank you for moments when you have been present. To recognize that presence 
is also to come to terms, God, that sometimes you feel absent. That nagging injury that won't go away, that fight that's pressing upon our hearts. the worry that keeps us up at night. We also want to give you those moments. We celebrate and reflect that life as you have made it is a paradox. Consolation, desolation, joy, sorrow. And as we think about our weeks, we reflect upon what you are calling us to. Perhaps you are calling us to step into faith, to forgive, to fearlessly move into the future. Maybe you're calling us to carve out some space to mourn, to be gentle with ourselves. Thank you because you've always been patient with us. And as we reflect upon what you have called us to do, we look towards tomorrow. Full of hope. And we pray in your name. Amen. Friends, may God give you the strength to look deep into yourselves and to find him. And as you find him, may he give you the courage to will the one thing, the one thing, which is a life spent in his service. God bless you.
it is another blessed Sabbath day after a great week, and I hope it's been a blessing for all of you as well. I get to be out here, and I hear the birds singing as I'm recording, and that's a pleasant sound too. At the end today, I'm greeting one of our birthday quartet members, Mike Thompson, so please listen up. This, my friends, is Ruth Nakashima, Sacramento, California, birthday 100. Congratulations, dear Ruth. And congratulations to you too, Elaine Ellis, Candler, North Carolina, birthday number 90. All the very best as I see you there with late husband Albert, my dear, dear friend. Sherry and Renee Cortez, Loma Linda, California, anniversary number 45. Here you were, here you are, and wow, pretty neat grandparents too. Shirley Welch Mulkern, Ottawa, Tennessee, birthday number 80. All the very best to you, lady, and with husband Bob, warmest congratulations. Gwen and Frank Dodini, Paradise, California, anniversary 25 on that happy day, and here you are, charming as ever. Christine Kuzma Cassidy, Riverside, California, birthday number 90. All the best to you, Christine, the young lady with grandson and then with son as well. Lois Patton, Walla Walla, Washington, 87th birthday for you. All the very best to this beautiful young lady and still very beautiful and with granddaughter at Loma Linda University graduation. Roddy Milosavljevic, Banning, California, part of the University Church family, 80th birthday man with dear wife, Ella, and vintage for sure, one awesome man surrounded by celebrating family. Lindsay Donahue, star, Idaho. Happy birthday, Lindsay, my granddaughter, married to my grandson, Bryce. There they are, and then with all of her boys, Bryce, Mason, and Gavin. Hello, Vera Davis, South Lancaster, Massachusetts, birthday number 91. All the best, Vera, there with great-granddaughter, Sherry Ray Nielsen, Paris, California, 68th birthday, Sherry. All the best to you there with nephew Scott. Bill Roberts, Auburn, Washington, one of Pastor Bill's most favorite occasions, a baptism and there with his late father and my friend, Van Roberts. John McGee, Redlands, California, birthday number 74. Hello, John, happy birthday. There with wife, Denise, and Denise and John marked their 52nd anniversary recently, and there the happy couple is. Barbara Bond Steiner, Corona, California. Hello, Barbara, happy birthday, lady. Great memories back to Eugene days and today as well. Eddie and Esther Norton, 73rd anniversary. Can you believe it, folks? Happy anniversary, you two. There you were. Here you are. And with son Gary. Dottie and Ray Frank, Mansfield, Pennsylvania, 67th anniversary. Another greeting because of these great photos I didn't have last week. You were... And indeed, you are. Dick and Norma Osborne, because of the recent happy developments in your lives and these great photos, I greet you again. Yes, Dick, congratulations on your honorary doctorate, your grandchildren announcing your title, Dr. Papa. Indeed, and here is the wonderful wedding memory for Norma and you. And again, you are blessed together. Ray and Rosie Tate. The same really goes for you folks because of the great pictures you posted on your anniversary date. There you were and as you are. Jana and Lloyd Perrin, Milton Freebutter, Oregon. 49th anniversary, you two. There you were and here you are and in a very favorite place. Claire Eva, Phoenix, Arizona. Hello, Claire. So glad to be reminded there with husband Will, 
Cammy and Brent Hardy, Arroyo Grande, California. 33rd anniversary for you two. There you were, and here you are. Terry Mace, Boise, Idaho. A special birthday, I know, and there with wife, Tricia. Opal Howard, Payette, Idaho. Hello, Opal. Happy birthday, Opal, and glad to be reminded of our days at Roseburg Junior Academy. Carolyn Rawson, Loma Linda these days. Happy birthday, Carolyn, there with husband Bob, and then with your sons. Margie and Jeffrey Rice, Ukiah, California. 42nd anniversary for you two. Yes, there you were, and here you are, and grandparents too. So proud of you, Margie, and blessed by your La Sierra Baccalaureate last Sabbath. Betty and Jim McMurray, Boring, Oregon, 41st anniversary for you too. Yes, you were, and you are, and some of your family's next two generations. Sylvia Davis, Redlands, California. Hello, Sylvia, happy birthday, lady, and there with your grandchildren. Hello, Mike Thompson, Redlands, California. Happy birthday, man. There, second from the left in that picture, and thank you for originating our birthday quartet there with your friends. Again, a very pleasant greeting to you all, and thank you, birthday quartet. <laughs>